All attempts in our world to change the rules so that people of God face a choice. Compromise or face the consequences. What's your passion? What is something that you really feel strongly about that you need to do something about? The prediction in the Old Testament of the coming of Jesus was with remarkable accuracy. The same with the second coming of Jesus. And this same God allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to save you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes. your name, to lift your name on high and to hear from you. In your holy and precious name. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see
lovely to see everybody this morning. We're looking at a very, very well-known passage this morning. Pastor Steve is away and uh, Pastor Jabin is away, but uh, Pastor Nick is here. I think Pastor John is here and I'm here and we're the only ones left. <laughs> but there you go. But this is the passage that we're looking at this morning is as you, if you're a visitor, um, we have been going through Mark's gospel and this is the passage that has been assigned to us today, the parable of the sower. When I started to look at the parable of the sower, it's interesting, it's, it's about outreach, it's about preaching the gospel. It fits in with the alpha theme that we are moving into. It just fits in very nicely and the interesting thing is that when, when I look at this in Luke's Gospel, the previous passage in Luke's Gospel is the Sermon on the Mount. And then after the Sermon on the Mount comes the parable of the sower. And there's a change there from the teaching ministry of Jesus to the telling of the parables. And this really got me thinking about the various ways in which Jesus presented the gospel. And so 
I googled it. The teaching methods of Jesus. And I found that there are nine of them. And thinking, we're thinking about reaching out and teaching and reaching people. And we've always already been given an, un, an indication. There is no one way. There is no one way. So let me, before I get into the, the parable, let me go through the teaching methods of Jesus. And these are interesting. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't use one way. If you want to be an effective teacher or preacher, one person said, model your methods after Jesus. So what was the first thing that Jesus did? What was his first method? Jesus spoke with authority. And this comes time after time where he will use the phrase, you have heard this, but I tell you. And it is the authority that Jesus had which drew people to him. He wasn't making suggestions. He was directly speaking with authority. And so we are told to preach the word, to tell stories, to be shocking, to craft sticky statements, to use object lessons, to repeat yourself, to create experiences and practice the truth that you preach. The crowds were amazed because he taught with one with authority. Your experience of coming to Christ gives you the authority to be able to speak about what God can do in another person's life. Your testimony, your faith in Christ and quoting the word of God is what gives us the authority. Jesus spoke with the authority. The, other, the others would, would speak and quote somebody else. But we are to speak and we are to quote Jesus. We are to quote the scriptures. The crowds were amazed because he talked with authority, unlike the other teachers. It is the message of the gospel with authority which changes people's life. Jesus did this because he was the word. He was God incarnate. He had the authority. And I say it again, through faith in Jesus Christ, we have the authority to preach the gospel. We cannot preach on our authority, but that's okay because Jesus gives us his authority. He tells us to go and share the gospel with others. We preach the word. Our power and authority comes from Jesus alone. The other one, and this is very relational, Jesus told stories. It's a, it's a fact that Jesus told countless stories. He pulled spiritual truth from everyday life. Not only did these stories make his teaching more memorable, they also connected in a much more profound way. It is a lot easier to remember a story. And the greatest story that you and I have is our coming to faith in Jesus Christ. That is our greatest story, how we came to faith in Jesus Christ. Someone said, think about the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus could have taught and said, God loves you so much that he will welcome you back no matter how sinful a life you've lived. But he didn't do that. He told them the parable of the son that went away from the father, the boy who disowned his family, who parted away his inheritance, who came home and to beg for mercy but was surprisingly welcomed with open arms by his father who waited daily for his return. Jesus would turn the most important things into a story that would stick in people's minds. 
And I repeat once again, the greatest story that you and I have is when we came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What's powerful? Well, telling a story. Tell stories, lots of them. Use everyday life to teach profound spiritual truths. Sometimes you want to say something. Just quoting scripture may not, to a non-Christian, make much. But if you can tell a story, if you can put it in story form, then it will help them to understand, which is why we give illustrations, obviously, in, in sermons. But the third thing that Jesus said and did, that Jesus shocked people. He shocked people. You know, sometimes we just want to get alongside and give people a cuddle. Well, Jesus didn't always do that. He used outrageous examples, exaggerations and shocking statements to get attention. Almost makes you think about politicians. These statements were not meant to be taken literally, but to get the point across, to share the message. For example, Jesus didn't really mean to rip out our eyes and amputate our hands for causing us to sin, or else all Christians would be blind amputees. I mean, you, can you imagine? Jesus said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. What did he say? If your eyes offend you, pluck it out. What did he say? I tell you what, the people that heard Jesus say that on the day never forgot it, did they? And so there are things that we can say, but this is a, a method of Jesus. He said things that would shock people. To get the point across. That is about a valid method. And he exaggerated the truth. This might help some of us. He exaggerated the truth to emphasise the point. The application. Shock people. Exaggerate a little. Say outrageous things that aren't meant to be literal. But grab attention and communicate the point clearly. The next thing that Jesus did, he crafted memorable sayings, things that would stick in people's mind. That's what the advertisers do, don't they? They get a phrase and uh, you can't get it out of your brain. But Jesus spoke poetically. He used catchy sayings and play on words. This isn't always apparent in English translations. However, in the original language, Jesus made it much easier for listeners to remember what he said. For example, Jesus memorably said, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will forgive, be forgiven. Give, and it will be given unto you. Another great example, of course, is the golden rule. Do unto others, they would do unto you. So here's the point, that we would use things, craft sticky statements. <laughs> That's the Andy Stanley, well-known American preacher, says, memorable is portable. If you can say something, if I can say something, make stick in people's minds. It's a way of getting the message across. So I, there's one, I'll leave you this one. This is one that I've, I've heard and it always resounds with me and it's simply this. Sin will keep you from the Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin. I read that somewhere years ago. But sin will keep you from the Bible, or the Bible will keep you from sin. 
In other words, it is absolutely important to read, study and memorise the scriptures. And that's just a statement that I heard. But you, you read them and let those statements stick in your mind. That one's one that's stuck in my mind. Now, the, the fifth thing that Jesus did, he asked questions. Sometimes we so want to tell people the gospel that we crowd them. Whereas Jesus, rather than just tell everybody the answer, Jesus let his listeners, uh, he, he led his listeners rather to conclusions by asking a lot of questions. It's a very simple way of the economy, or what's happening here, or what's happening there. What do you think about that? What do you think about eternal life? I saw that one the other day, a cartoon, and I put it up on Facebook. Some of you would have seen it. It was just a, a very simple cartoon which says, everybody will live for eternity. The only difference is location, location, location. I thought that was a good one. I mean, <laughs> that, that really stuck in my mind. And I thought, you know, and I put that up because I thought that's just a different way of presenting the gospel. Everybody is going to live for eternity. It's just location, location, location. But anyway, Jesus asked questions. And when you look at this, and I looked at it and found out that Jesus asked 173 questions. Sometimes you just pick your moment. So what do you think about this? What do you think about life after death? What do you think about Jesus on the cross saying, Father, I forgive them, for they know not what they do? A good question can really get a good discussion going. Ask the Lord to give you some inspiration. How do you spend your time? How do you think we're going to get out of this mess in Australia? How do you think we're going to recover? What do you think is going to happen internationally? How long do you think it'd be before China is a real problem to us in Australia? Questions stimulate critical thinking. Good questions make people demand answers. Ask a lot of questions and do not underestimate the power of a good question. Jesus asked questions all of them. Who do men say that I am? And then Jesus used visual illustrations. Jesus often used object lessons to, use the to explain the concrete truth to his listeners. He washed the feet of his disciples. Boy, did he get their attention. To teach servant leadership. What can we do that will open people's eyes? He called a little child to him to discuss childlike faith. You can see Jesus is trying, he's taking all the truths and he is trying to make them as easy to understand as he possibly could. He described unselfish giving after watching a widow drop two small coins into the temple offering. He commended her. And then when he told the parable of the sower, Someone said there was probably a good chance he was standing in the field right there. 
There was the wheat growing. And he turned around and he talked about it. And then number seven, Jesus used repetition. How many of you remember your times tables? Oh, my goodness. I, I think it was grade four. I have forgotten, but I just, I just remember my times tables and, and uh, every morning we repeat them, we repeat them, we repeat them. And, you know, it's funny. It's really helped, it's really helped me with uh, finance. <laughs> Be, you know, I used to, you can't do it these days because um, I, I, I used, you know, when we use cash, right? And I used to go up and I'd say, you know, I'd, I'd buy a drink and I'd buy a sandwich and something else. And, 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 and then, the, then, the, then the person serving, we'd go and add it all up and they'd come back to me and I'd give them the exact change. And they'd look at me. They, they, they had to use a calculator. But I, I guess the times tables helped and, and the arithmetic helped. But I used to love that because they, they, they couldn't figure out how I worked it out. But anyway, that was just something. But, but Jesus used rep, repetition. The one thing, he taught the major themes again and again. And Jesus spoke of his death and resurrection over and over and over again. In Mark 8, 31, 9, 31, 10, 33, 34, and his disciples still didn't get it. Repetition is so important. That's what, well, I've already given the illustration. That's what's helped me with mass. Didn't help me with a couple of other subjects, but anyway, it helped me with maths. But repetition. But here's the, here's the point. Jesus did it. And we do it with our children, don't we? We know that sometimes they don't get it the first time. And so we need to use repetition. You, we're going to come to the parable of the sower. And of course, part of us, are saying, oh, I think I've heard a few sermons on the parable of the sower before which is why I decided to do this introduction. But Jesus used the repetition. Sometimes people need to hear something many times before they get it. Some of us get it like that. Some of us need a bit more explanation. And some of us wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh, right, and light goes on and we get it. The application, the need to re-repeat, re, Repetition builds emphasis and breeds memory. What gets repeated gets remembered. Find the main point of the message and say it over and over again. All right. The eighth illustration of, of Jesus' method. He created experiences. It wasn't enough for people to just listen to his teachings. Jesus gave instructions and called them what to do, what he said. For example, he didn't teach his disciples what to do. He sent them out to do it and brought them back when they were done. And he got them then to tell him what they had done and go through it and revise you will have the opportunity in the Alpha course to learn how to do it, to sit down and talk about it week after week and come back next week and share it and, and that's the way it will grow. Jesus' teaching demanded action, but not everybody could handle it, such as the rich young ruler. When Jesus told him to go and sell all he had, he couldn't handle it. You know, it is very sad sometimes when we present the gospel and people turn away. But we have to understand if people turned away from Jesus, they will turn away from us. It is not our responsibility. It is our responsibility to share our faith in Jesus Christ. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin and righteousness and of judgment. If we do our part, then we do not need to feel guilty. We have done our part in sharing the love 
of Jesus Christ. And that's why you want to do the Alpha course, so you can know how to share the gospel. I have used so many opportunities to share the gospel in my lifetime. Practically every funeral service I've taken, I've always shared the gospel. I don't think I've ever had, and I've offered the tracts, eternity, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody come to faith in Christ by doing that because I've never seen anybody come up to me and ask any further questions. But you know what? I haven't got a clue what God has done in the lives of people who've taken those tracts. You know, the number of times, and I've said this before, that I have found out later people have come to Christ because they've told me and I didn't have a clue. That's the most wonderful thing about sharing faith. If you don't see a response... Just don't believe that that doesn't happen because sometimes it takes people to talk to someone once or to talk to somebody else or to read this or to read that and, and finally the penny drops and you and I might have spoke to them but we don't know a thing about it when they finally come. When we get to heaven, when you get to heaven, Who are you going to run into as you thought would never be there? That's an interesting one. I guarantee there will be people. Perhaps someone that you've spoken to, someone you've tried to reach, someone you thought you never reached, but somehow along the way they've come to faith in Jesus Christ. And finally, Jesus practised what he preached. There's no greater example of a preacher following his own teachers than Jesus. He didn't just teach on prayer. He often withdrew to pray. Jesus just didn't teach on loving sinners. He had dinner with them. Jesus lived what he said. He didn't just talk a good talk. He walked the walk, even to the death on the cross. So there's the final part of the lesson. Practice what you preach. The greatest lessons we teach come our lot, come from our lives, not from our mouths. By the way, I mentioned they are the nine ways that Jesus presented the gospel. And do you know what? From a practical point of view, how each one of us share the gospel may well differ. I've had the opportunity of preaching all over the place. I've had opportunity of preaching in Australia. When I was down the Gold Coast, I used to go out Saturday nights giving out tracts in Coolangatta. I've, I've done all sorts of things. Some of you may remember I used to do ventriloquism. I did ventriloquism here in about 1992 and... Uh, I did it on TV with Christian Television Association. I've I've done all sorts of things. And, and, And God will use you in many various ways. But um, you just won't always see the results. We walk by faith. We walk by faith. And um, praise God, He can use every one of us. But whatever one of those things really hits you this morning, these are the the different ways. Jesus used nine different ways. He asked 173 questions. And if you want a copy of those questions, Catherine up the back, she's she's printed them out. So you can come and and ask them for her. But you you can just go and Google it yourself. 173 questions Jesus asked and it'll come up and you, can, and, and you can print it out. So while we're talking about the parables, I just wanted you to know about all the different ways that Jesus presented the gospel. He used all the different ways. Now we are different people. We are different personality. The most important thing is that we love the Lord 
that we all have different gifts and ministries that we use the gifts that God has given us. And like the body of Christ, we all work together. So they, they, those are the methods that Jesus used. And so now we come to the parable of the sower. And this is really important once again, and I've almost covered a lot of this. But with the parable of the sower, there were the, there were the different responses. Jesus said the man goes out and he throws out the seed and it goes everywhere. And you know, that is like, I can tell you that is like preaching. Um, <laughs> fun, funny things happen when you preach, you know. Um, you, you preach and someone comes up and says, oh, thank you, I, I really appreciated uh, what you said there. That really got home to me. And, and you really didn't think that you said that anyway. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's, it's just amazing what, what people think and what they listen to but also it's amazing sometimes what, what gets through to people. Some, sometimes you, you think you're not getting through. But the Lord has got through to people. But from a practical point of view, by the time you finish the Alpha course, understand that there will be some people that if you want to share faith, they turn off like that. You won't get to the first base. And that's what Jesus said. The birds of the air come and take the seed away. The thoughts come, oh, no, I don't believe in that. You know, no, I haven't believed in that since I was, I was a kid. And then you, you have the, 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 the people who get excited. And we see this. People get excited and they say they want to give their life for Christ and they're excited for a while and then the problems of life come and they fall away. Now that can be discouraging. You know, I, many of you like this. You grow up in a church, you grow up in a youth group and you see so many drop away. But Jesus said it would happen. Jesus said that people through the cares of the world will fall away. And you and I must not get discouraged by that. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And we need, as long as we have sown the seed... As long as we have done everything we can to encourage people. That's what counts. We, it is so true that we can get discouraged. Things do happen. People do say things that they shouldn't say. You feel like shooting them. But, you know, this, this is life. And, of course, you know, people, Scripture once again, is, is teaching us that, that, that people go for money, people go for pleasure. And so all of a sudden, they, they, they're taking their eyes off Jesus. And we have the cares and the problems in the world, and people just look at that and say, oh, you know, what can we do? What can we do? The trouble is, you can't walk on water unless you keep your eyes on Jesus. As soon as, soon as Peter took his eyes off Jesus, he was sinking. So that's the challenge for each one of us. And I, 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 I just leave this with you today. Not everything that you say or do for the kingdom of God will bring forth the fruit that you want to see. And sometimes, quite frankly, as a Christian, you and I will face issues which will absolutely knock us flat. Some people that we thought were really strong in the faith will turn away. 
And the big challenge is, you know, and I, in early life I, I had this happen with, you know, friends turn away. And it's really sad. It's really sad. But, you know, uh, Jesus had people turn away and he said to the disciples, you go. I said, who else has the words of eternal life? Nobody else has the words of eternal life. That gets us back to, the, to where we were before. You know, everybody's going to have live in eternity. It's just location, location, location. So I thank God that we in every way are sharing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and I pray a blessing on those of you who are doing the Alpha course. But I ask you to meditate on the way in which God would use you. God uses some of us with, you know, well, the Lord's given me the opportunity to preach. And like I said, I, I, I preach in all sorts of places. And there are other things that I'm not very, not very capable of doing. But, you know, that's, that's just the gifts and the talents that God gives us. We are the family of God. And we are to encourage one another and bless one another and build one another up. And don't worry what happens. The headlines are never going to be all that hot by the look of it. But Jesus, we keep our eyes on Jesus. He is our hope. We just keep sowing the seed and praying that the Holy Spirit brings things to germinate. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you today. We want to thank you that Jesus knew people, understood people, and reached out to those people in different ways. To the children, he just picked them up and he spoke with them ever so gently. To the rich young man, he, he spoke very, very directly and he couldn't handle it. Father, I thank you for all the gifts and ministries that you give us. And I pray to you, God, that you will bless us as we seek to share the gospel with the lost. Father, help us to craft the stories. Help us to get the questions. Help us, dear God, to know when to speak and when not to speak. But, Father, we thank you that if we are just faithful and sharing the love of Jesus Christ, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. Please use us for your glory. Father, help us not to be discouraged but to keep our eyes on Jesus and to be the soul of the earth and the light of the world. In his name we pray. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace Jesus. I just want to see.